Hi, I'm Tommy Thompson and this is Design Die, my game design series as part of AI and Games. In this video, I wanted to talk about an interesting AI-driven game mechanic that's become increasingly prevalent in modern video game design, procedural content generation. The process of adopting intelligent systems that build and craft content that users are intended to consume as part of a given game. BCG is everywhere in modern video games, such as the level design of a variety of games ranging from Caves of Cud to Spelunky and Warframe, the character design in games such as Shadow of Mordor, all the way to the planets and even star systems in No Man's Sky. In this video, I'm going to talk about one of my favourite examples of generative systems in AAA games, Gearbox's 2012 role-playing first-person shooter, Borderlands 2. The Borderlands series embraces PCG for the purposes of its looting system, allowing players to grab a variety of weapons, shields, grenades and other items. Players accumulate a stack of these items to help them in their struggles against the manic denizens of Pandora and the ruthless armies of the Hyperion Corporation. But what makes Borderlands so special? Well, in my opinion, Borderlands is one of the best examples of how to design, apply, integrate and subsequently market a procedural generation system in recent memory. It's a system so critical to the core gameplay loops and design of the series that without it, the game would certainly lose much of its charm and drive. Perhaps more importantly, the game is about how players develop a personal and potentially emotional attachment to procedurally generated content and when we are ready to let those relationships fade. Now I suspect that the Borderlands series, or any other game I've raised already, can bring with it emotional reactions to the strength and diversity of the content crafted by these generators. Procedural generation is faced with a challenge in almost every game between the methods used to generate new content and the manner in which players interact with it. As such, how do we maintain a player's engagement with a generative system the more we interact with it? As we continue to play the same game, the stitches and seams behind that system begin to become more apparent. It's an interesting problem that manifests in different ways given it's largely game dependent. Now you might be wondering why Borderlands? Well, in part because Spelunky, which is a very good example of how this is done, has been discussed at length already, and I doubt I have much to add to that. Meanwhile, I think Borderlands, specifically Borderlands 2, doesn't get the credit it deserves for how well it pulls this off. Borderlands 2 is a game about love, in the strangest possible sense I can think of anyway. So in this design dive, we're going to talk about procedural generation what it is, how do we engage with it, what can influence our perception of its value in the context of a game's core loop, and why Borderlands 2 really is a game about love. Procedural content generation, or PCG, is an algorithmic process through which artifacts can be built for the purposes of adoption within the context of a defined problem domain. What that means, to borrow from Mike Cook's proc jam, is that we make something that makes something. PCG can be used to create a variety of things, such as game logic and rules, cosmetic items such as character and weapon skins, tools for terrain construction and decoration, level designs and map structure, loadouts for equipment and weapons, all the way to the likes of stories and quests for in-game progression. In truth, you can pretty much come up with a procedural generator for many aspects of game development once you begin to figure out how to encode it and to allow for an element of randomness to be injected into that creation process. Despite this, it doesn't mean that PCG is necessarily easy. If anything, it's highly problem dependent and can prove rather taxing as the types of things we wish to generate build in size and scope. But also, as problem spaces become larger, we start to need to think about the logic and constraints that hold it all together. Spelunky levels have a very specific structure, given they operate as a platformer where players are deep diving into caves. Unexplored adheres to a style akin to the Zelda style dungeon formula. The planets of No Man's Sky need to be, well, planets. But once we have something that can generate an output, we need to start considering how varied that system is. Not just that it creates lots of different things, but whether those things can be considered relatively distinct from one another. One avenue that can help address this is the notion of expressivity analysis, a method pioneered by games academic Gillian Smith, whereby designers establish useful metrics for the generated output that allows us to understand them within a perceived design space but also whether the generator itself is limited by the manner in which it's been constructed. This is a big problem that many procedural generation systems face, 
given that they create something that has a distinct structure or formula to it, but we want it to have sufficient variety to differentiate one output from another. As soon as we have any sort of algorithm running behind the scenes, which, you know, is kind of unavoidable when writing software, it's dictating a structure to how outputs are built. Naturally, this is where pseudo-random number generation is used to mix things up with each and every release, but also it can come down to how we encode the problem. There are games, of course, where being random, albeit familiar, is good. Infinite Runners are a great example of this, where we want something that is unpredictable, but also familiar enough within a small period of time, such that players can quickly respond and act accordingly. Meanwhile, games that are more long-term in their length, as well as core game loop, such as, say, No Man's Sky and Caves of Cud, want to have content that's rather different from the last piece of content we interacted with, given we want to retain a sense of novelty as each hour of the game progresses. Now, with that in mind, let's give a quick overview of the game itself. Borderlands 2 is a role-playing first-person shooter in which players assume the role of one of six characters who act as Vault Hunters, a sort of bounty hunter who specialises in finding treasure locked away in... Vaults. It's tied into the mythos of the franchise that kind of makes sense, just run with it. In each game in the series, players level up their character abilities as they play through a variety of campaign and side missions but the core FPS mechanics are largely powered through use of a procedural generation system, which is responsible for creating every pistol, submachine gun, shotgun, combat rifle, sniper rifle, rocket launcher, iridium weapon, shield, grenade and class mod in the game. Players find new weapons by visiting treasure chests and other similar weapon storing cubby holes throughout each mission, as well as receiving them for completing specific tasks within the game. A big part of the core game loop is finding new weapons and experimenting with them as you visit new locales on the planet of Pandora, where monsters become increasingly more powerful and resistant to your existing weaponry. Borderlands is arguably one of the most well-known contemporary video game franchises to have popularised the use of procedural content generation within AAA games. Borderlands creates weapons through a rather straightforward construction technique of putting together individual components, namely the stock, body, barrel, magazine, sight, accessory and grip of the weapon. Each of these components has an influence on what the final outcome is in terms of the type of weapon, its aesthetic as well as the stats it carries. Borderlands ties the procedural generation to the established lore, whereby all generated loot is built by one of 12 different manufacturers, with only 10 of them actually making weapons, and only 8 of them appearing in Borderlands 2 and Borderlands the pre-sequel. Each weapon manufacturer has an influence on the attributes of a weapon, as well as the type of weapon it can be, with manufacturer buffs that are balanced to ensure they don't create ridiculously unbalanced weapons. For example, Dahl weapons have very low recoil, but they don't manufacture shotguns. Jacob's weapons tend to have very high damage, but the recoil and fire rate are poor and they don't manufacture rocket launchers. Plus, Malawan only manufactures weapons with elemental damage, but they don't craft assault rifles or shotguns. The weapon body dictates not only the type of weapon it's going to be, but also the fire and damage rates, as well as the constraints on what additional components can then be added. After that, the stock influences accuracy and stability, barrel influences damage ratings and accuracy, the magazine dictates ammunition capacity, reload and equip speeds, the sight influences the zoom, as well as the field of view properties, and the grip doesn't really have any further effect on the weapon itself. The final part of the weapon is the accessory, which adds a range of benefits such as damage modifiers, stability bonuses, but more importantly, the possibility of the weapon having one of five types of elemental damage. Corrosive, Explosive, Incendiary, Shock and Slag. The name of the weapon is also derived from its type, the manufacturer and any capabilities given to it by its accessory. The actual rarity of a weapon is decided before it's generated, with eight different rarity levels to choose from. However, rarity is actually a rather crude assessment, given it only really helps establish the approximate power of the weapon and doesn't necessarily influence how good it is when it comes out the other end. It's primarily used to identify the rarity of the drop for players and to recognise how infrequent it is to discover in the game. A final point to make is that Borderlands adheres to the constructivist view of procedural generation, whereby the constraints that exist on the construction of a given asset ensure that it is usable, though not necessarily any good. In addition, the asset generation system doesn't factor human player preferences or performance. The levels of items are influenced by the enemies that drop them or the area the chests exist within with some scaling in place if the player is playing in normal or true Vault Hunter mode, which is sort of new game plus for Borderlands games. While the final weapon count was never made clear for Borderlands 2, Gearbox did concede that the original Borderlands carried somewhere in the region of 17.75 million generated weapons. Now with this in mind, 
What makes this such a good PCG system in the context of other games? Well, it doesn't really. The crux of the issue isn't the actual weapons it's generating, but rather the way in which players interact with that content. Let's take a moment to talk about the biases and expectations players build when they begin to interact with a PCG system in a game. Coming back to my earlier point, what about how we, as game players, are interacting with the generation systems? Are we even aware of them? Do we care about how they are operating? Is that important for us in the context of how we are exploring and interacting with that game, and perhaps critically, are we introducing our own biases and expectations as we interact with it? I have a couple of thoughts on that. If we're not conscious of it, or generally indifferent towards its output, PCG systems are just a novelty within the core design of the game. This can be seen in the likes of, say, the initial map configuration in a game of Civilization, or a round of terrorist hunt in Rainbow Six Siege. In either case, I suspect these aren't deal breakers for most players. Rather, we simply accept the setup as is and move on. If we don't, then we can simply quit or restart the sequence to get something a bit more desirable. Though in each of these cases, we're dealing with a game whereby these stochastic elements inject a small amount of challenge that we have to work around in the coming match, which may in fact tie into the game's core appeal. Meanwhile, if we're conscious or influenced by the existence of a generative system, we're immediately dealing with issues of player expectations. This arrives in many forms, given that humans are typically untrusting of systems influenced by pseudo-randomness, as well as being able to actually interpret randomness. Humans have a bad habit of inferring patterns and context from everything, it's kind of how we operate. As such, something as simple as a coin toss can be seen as biased based on the observation of several outcomes. This is compounded by the fact that players frequently find context or policy behind game mechanics that simply don't exist or expect more from what are otherwise simple algorithmic processes. So when something occurs in a game that is driven by a pseudo-random process, players are quick to assume that the game is actively working against them, or that it's simply not working hard enough to generate interesting content. I suspect that the more we interact with generative systems and the rate at which we interact with it can influence our perceptions. Spelunky successfully balances that need to be both random yet familiar, but that's largely because we pass through levels quickly and frequently. As such, that familiarity breeds confidence and understanding of the space we're in and how best to utilise the mechanics within it. This can easily be observed as we watch speedrunners or score runners of the game. They've not only mastered the mechanics, but also developed an implicit understanding of the level generator and its behaviour in order to shave precious seconds off their time. Meanwhile, games such as No Man's Sky come with bigger expectations. The time between visiting new planets can be pretty significant and it requires a lot of resources to achieve it. This ties back to the previous video on Dark Souls where I discussed reward structures and the time between any real sense of gratification. No Man's Sky's core medium-term reward loop is pretty big if your focus is largely on exploration. As such, the time between interactions with the generative system, even though all planets are pre-generated, drives expectations of seismic differences between each planet. I fear that this is also tied to the expectations driven by science fiction, and that planets typically adhere to archetypes such that they are visually distinct from one another. Sometimes that can happen in No Man's Sky, but typically it won't. We'll see something new, for sure, but new within the context of that defined algorithm, and a lot of players struggle to deal with that reality. So in essence, I bring the whole thing down to two core elements. Whether the PCG is in the foreground, well, you know, does the player know or care that it's active, and the rate of interaction with the system in context of the core reward loop of the game. These two elements have a huge impact on our expectations of the variety by that generative system. Now you're probably wondering, Tommy, what on earth does any of this have to do with Borderlands 2? Right, let's dive into this. The Borderlands series approaches the looting system in a manner that's quite common in video game design. It provides loot within missions, which can range from currencies to ammunition all the way to procedurally generated items. Bigger and more valuable loot will appear at the end of missions or be delivered to you as a reward for completing the task presented. There is still plenty of weapons and shields that are still interesting, but often are rather common and less useful. In certain circumstances, specific loot items will drop in the game, though not necessarily with the exact same stats. Now, let me start with an important caveat to my argument. 99% of all guns and shields generated within Borderlands are f***ing awful. But that is ultimately part of the charm of the game. 
Each mission, be it conducted in single or multiplayer, is pushing the player into situations that not only result in hectic combat, but will ultimately reward them with new and more bombastic weapons. But even then, we will typically still scoop up all the less interesting weapons along the way. We're actually interacting with the PCG system fairly frequently, and that weapon variety is strong, even if the quality of the weapons is usually pretty low. Players become accustomed to the idea of gathering up weapons for sale, or in time just ignoring the lesser ones. Our expectations of where good weapons are is tied to the mission structures of the game because that is the core medium term reward mechanism for players. We visit a new location, smoke some fools, and then when the dust is settled and everyone's dead can dig into some sweet sweet loot. But Tommy, I hear you ask, how does this make Borderlands 2 any more special than other loot driven games? And didn't you say something about love? Yes, I did. So here we go. Borderlands is a game that crafts stories around players and their loving relationships with their guns. As discussed, the game revolves around finding that 1% of the PCG system's output. We're looking for the outliers, the things that are just that one step cooler than anything else. But even when we find them, we're looking for the one that's right for us. Anyone who's played a Borderlands game can relate back to at least one or more items they've collected that had some real meaning or value to them during their playthrough. Like that time you found a shotgun that fired six rounds at once that does acid damage and reload it by throwing it into someone's face. We develop a strong emotional attachment. We identify some weapons as our favourites to stop them being scrapped. We have them ready for that exact situation we know they'll come in handy. Even over time, when they've outgrown their value, we put them into Claptrap's locker to pass between generations of our characters, such that they might prove useful once again. Every time we find a new batch of loot, we're left to question whether weapons we've been using have outlived their usefulness. Have we found something better? Something that feels better, handles better, shoots better, reloads better? All of these are highly subjective ideas that tie heavily into how we roleplay that game. I suspect I'm not the only one who's continued to use weapons that have been surpassed in stats by new ones purely because I've found a gameplay style that really suits that weapon and is one we're really happy with. We don't want to go through that change. But also, don't forget Borderlands is an online cooperative game. As such, what makes this whole thing even better is that the cosmetic effects by weapons, as well as the damage they deal, can be observed by other players. I've wasted plenty of time with friends online showcasing to one another that cool new weapon we found, and visiting locations to show off our newfound abilities. The water cooler moment, if that sort of thing exists anymore, is talking about the cool new items we find within the game. We're seeking the outliers in this PCG system, and when we find them, that's what we talk about. Not the other 499 shitty things we scooped up and sold to Marcus along the way. We covet them. We build our gameplay styles around the weapons we love most. We show them to our friends, and when the time has come for us to move on, we either give them to our friends, or pass them down between generations of our characters. Gearbox successfully captured that inane and often quirky aspect in the game itself. Its characters are oddball, its plot often thin, stupid at times, a point the game itself likes to revel in, but that's what makes the whole thing come together really well. It's a fun framing device for your gun fetish, and it doesn't have to worry too hard about justifying itself, unlike some other games I could mention. I don't even have time to explain why I don't have time to explain. While you might find there are other games that fit this bill, for me Borderlands 2 is the one that pulls this off best. Borderlands defined the space, the sequel refined it, and the pre-sequel, well, I've never actually got around to playing it as I still play the second one quite a bit. Heck, the sequel even pulled off this clever post-ironic backlash to the marketing by Sony for No Man's Sky four years before it even came out. It makes light of its generated outputs, because it knows full well what is important to its identity, and how it wants players to resonate with that. Now I'm not saying Gearbox are infallible, far from it, you can even go back to videos in this series where I talk about their mistakes at length, but it's a rare case where a game came together in a way that struck a chord with a whole new audience and has certainly helped drive the RPG FPS subgenre to a larger crowd. But despite how far we've came since, it's still not too late to take a visit to Pandora and fall in love all over again. Ah, that was fun. I've been looking forward to getting this one off my chest. A lot more upbeat than the Dark Souls catharsis, am I right? I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. 
Are you a fan of Borderlands? Did you find that totes amaze gun that you loved showing to your friends? Or did you think it's a load of boss and not much fun to play? Either way, let us know in the comments. I love hearing from you. In the meantime... Jeez, sorry, I just realised I said totes amaze unironically in a sentence. F*** me, I'm old. <clears throat> in the meantime... If you did like the video, do me a solid and give it a cheeky like, and maybe even subscribe to AI and Games as well. It's not just these game design focused critiques on the channel, it's mainly case studies looking at AI applications and research in video games, but also tutorials, AI 101s and a bunch of other cool stuff. This video, like all others, is possible thanks to the good people who support AI and Games on Patreon. I'm a one-man crowdfunded show, and it's thanks to these good people that are on screen right now that I can continue to make this happen. This will be the last major video for 2017. Thank you so much for what has been a stellar year for me at AI and Games. This channel is going out to a bigger audience than ever before. Design the dive seems like it's went pretty well so far. And I'm super excited for what's coming in 2018. Patrons already have a good idea of what's coming, but watch this space in January. Something big is coming this way.